Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome everybody to the MIT Faculty Forum Online. Uh, my name is Aviva Rutkin. I am a news automation engineer at Bloomberg, and I'll be your moderator for today's webcast. Today's broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union, MIT Professional Education, and MIT Sloan Executive Education. So before we get started, uh, as a reminder, we welcome all your questions during the chat. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A feature on your toolbar, and we'll do our, our best to get to as many questions as we can today. So today, we are talking with Robert Metcalf, class of 68, the co-founder of 3Com and inventor of the Ethernet. Metcalf is Professor of Innovation and Murchison Fellow of Free Enterprise at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and we'll put a link to his full bio there in the chat. So everyone, please welcome Professor Metcalf and he'll begin by giving us an overview of his thoughts on connectivity and technology in the year of COVID-19. I think you're on, on mute, Professor. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, there we go. Take it away. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're, we're still debugging this connectivity thing. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take 15 minutes to uh, convince you all that the most important new fact about the human condition is that we are now suddenly connected. I'm going to try to convince you that connectivity is a thing uh, worthy of study, and I'm going to uh, enjoy the fact that the internet was here just in time for the arrival of COVID-19. So you probably don't know the old Chinese saying, but it's worth repeating that if you want to get rich, the first thing you do is build a road. That is, you get connected. And here's a picture of the Roman Empire. All, ro all roads lead to Rome. And notice its elaborate road system. My uh, ancestors were instrumental in building the early roads for the uh, Industrial Revolution. Of course, the, the thanks they got is that their name was misspelled. So this guy, Jack Metcalf, was building roads. And those roads really did underlie the growth of the uh, Industrial Revolution. But I was born in 1946. And there's a picture of me. And you'll notice prophetically, I am holding a telephone. And I was very lucky to be born in 46, because 47 was a big year. The wireless, wireless TV began its commercial ramp. The microwave oven was invented. But most importantly, in 1947, the transistor was invented. And with the invention of the transi transistor, the emphasis in connectivity shifted. It shifted from physical connectivity, that is the transport of atoms, it slowly started shifting toward the uh, transmission of bits, the digital transistor-based forms of connectivity, and it was my good fortune to be born right then. At MIT in 1969, I had a class project. Uh, it was to build a memory for a computer, and I built an acoustic delay line memory where we stored the bits at the speed of sound around a very long cable. And in the building of this class project, I became an expert at using early digital electronics to send one bit at a time down a very long wire. And that was very good timing because at around that same year, the internet was born, October 29th, 1969. And the first pictured here is the first four node internet, UCSB, SRI, Utah, and uh, UCLA. And MIT wanted to be on this internet thing and so they looked for somebody who was good at sending bits one at a time down a long wire. And that was me. So I got the job of building this beautiful device, which put MIT on the internet in 1970. I built two of them, actually. I built one for MIT, and that's in the upper right here. And then I built, I went to Xerox Research, and I built another one of those for Xerox. So I put MIT and Xerox on the internet. And this is the internet in 1973. And we, I like to call this the kilobit internet in that 
even the massive transcontinental trunks of the internet were running at 50 kilobits per second. That's a prefix that's not used much anymore. So in 1972, having put MIT and Xerox in the internet, what next? And here's my office in 1972. And I'd like to point out here on the right is a Texas Instruments Silent 700 state-of-the-art computer terminal, ran at 300, 300 bits per second, 300 bits per, 300 bits per second. By the way, up here is a box of 35 millimeter slides. We didn't have PowerPoint. I was on the board later. I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. That was, we sold it to Microsoft in 1987. This is 1972. So we were connecting ourselves using 35 millimeter slides. Let's see. Here is an actual Rolodex. Here is the tape dispenser that I used to um, uh, tape business cards onto my Rolodex cards. This thing with the cables here is called a telephone. Here are what we refer to as pencils here. And missing from the picture, but I've added it, over here in the lower right is an IBM Selectric typewriter. So in that technological context, I typed a memo using the orator ball, uh, inventing ethernet to connect the personal computers at Xerox Research together. And this is the, a drawing from that memo. This is a, a mile long, half inch uh, coaxial cable into which various PCs, they were called Altos, would tap into the shared cable and ethernet would allow them to exchange uh, data packets. And here you see the connection of two sites using a telephone network, called it the telephone ether. And on the far right here, you'll see anticipating a radio, a radio ether, uh, or what later became known as Wi-Fi. So this is the slide in which I claim to have invented Wi-Fi also, just, just to annoy the Wi-Fi inventors. So we built this in personal computers, Altos, one on every desk. Of course, you can't see the network here because it's out. it goes out the back up into the ceiling. And in building that network, uh, I began my lifelong association with connectivity. And one of the key features of the internet was it had an architecture for connectivity. It wasn't just building stuff. And so we had this seven level model of how the network should be architected and of the way it was built, the way it was designed, I could work on building ethernet only involving the physical layer and the data link layer here. And all that other stuff could go on with other people and other places at its own rate. And together we all uh, built the internet. So this is a beginning connectivity architecture uh, for uh, the internet. Now ethernet, thought of in the old way, used Manchester encoding to send bits down the coax at 2.4 megabits per second. It used a, a Gerald vampire tap to puncture the shared cable to get connection to the copper center conductor, or, at, or the use of Aloha Net randomized retransmissions for taking turns, sending packets on this shared cable. All three of those technologies were in the original Ethernet, but are long gone. What really got invented by Ethernet was none of those. Ethernet brought the new internet architecture to the desktop, the packet architecture, as opposed to the character architecture. So we went from characters to packets. We also greatly increased the bandwidth. In fact, we increased it by a factor of 10,000, not 100 times, not 1,000 times, 10,000 times speed up from that 300 bits per second terminal I showed you to a 2.94 megabit per second coax. And the third uh, quote invention of uh, Ethernet was Ethernet joined TCP IP as open industry standards for connecting computers together. I then in 79 started a company to start selling Ethernet and the associated internet protocols. And I had a hard time because our company was aimed at networking uh, personal computers, but of course in 1979 there were no personal computers to speak of. A few Apple IIs kicking around. So we had trouble selling our network. So we, we sold a lot of three node networks and our customers said the, the network does exactly what you said, but it's just not useful. 
So as a, uh, the head of marketing of my little startup, I came up with this 35 millimeter slide that basically said, and this is a connectivity theory slide. And basically it said, the reason your little networks are not useful is that they're too small. And what's the remedy for that? Buying more of my company's products. So this was a sales tool that subsequently, subsequently became known as Metcalf's Law. That is the value of the network grows as the square of the number of connected devices, the number of potential connections, whereas the cost of the network only grows as the linear. So here's a law bearing on the topic of connectivity. Of course, there was a much more important law floating around called Moore's Law, dated 1965. Here's one of my favorite pictures of Gordon Moore explaining to me that even though our laws both began with M, his was a a better law than mine. And then of course there was Marty Cooper's law, a, a lesser known law, but a, a definite law of connectivity. And Marty noted that uh, Marconi who had won the Nobel prize for radio in the early, in 1905, I think it was, uh, he won the prize for having radio going further and further and further, ultimately across the Atlantic. But, uh, Martin's Law pointed out that ever since then, all progress in a radio telephone have been getting the radios to go shorter and shorter distances. As the cells get shorter and shorter, we make better use of the available bandwidth. And that was predicted by uh, Marty being the inventor of the mobile telephone here. Uh, his law has been true since 1905. That is the number of communications you can get in, per unit area uh, double frequently. So anyway, the internet is now as of October 29th of last year, 50 years old. And it's my contention that the most important new fact about the human condition is that we are now suddenly connected. Uh, the internet, this is a, a rough plot of the internet surging from 1990 at the left there all the way to uh, 2019. And so, uh, and by the way, the World Wide Web turned 30 the same year the internet turned 50. So we're already networking over 4 billion human beings and it's growing rapidly, 9% per year as of last year. So already 57% of us, 7.7 .7 billion humans or more are now on the internet. And there are things on the internet now suddenly and there are already more things on the internet than there are human beings. So my claim is that 50 years is a sudden growth of connectivity, that it hasn't taken very long for us to go from zero to 57%. Now, another argument that can be made is that this is a chart of a human population with the green, the green is the, uh, the number of people who are not uh, extremely poor. And the red is the number of people who are extremely poor. And you'll see the gradual growth of, growth of both since 1820. But then something happened. Something happened. And the, the first, this first blue line right here is the arrival of the internet in 69. And then this second blue line is the arrival of the World Wide Web circa 1995 or so. And you'll notice an interesting thing. When those two things happened, the growth of the number of extremely poor people started a rapid decline. Now I'm aware of the difference between causality and correlation, but I will argue that the growth of connectivity has contributed generally to freedom and prosperity. Now with this connectivity comes disruptions, US mail, publishing, commerce, journalism, advertising, we're all telecommunications, the convergence of the voice, video, and data industries. All of these are being disrupted by connectivity. And now as connectivity marches on, we're now disrupting education, energy, healthcare, and other things. And someday, see this conversation we're having right now would ordinarily have been held at 10 to 50, but now it's being held uh, uh, using the transport of our bits rather than the transport of our atoms. Connectivity also has its pathologies. You don't remember this, but in the early days of the internet, the big worry was that it would be used to transport porn. 
And that was qu quickly handled. And as, as you know, no more porn on the internet. Instead, advertising came along in the mid 90s as a monetization technique, which basically funded from the mid 90s onward the growth of the internet. Companies like Google and Facebook, for example. Of course, advertising led to spam and other pathology, polarization of communities, radicalization of terrorists, addiction, privacy, uh, threats to privacy and security. And a little joke here I, I, I put millennials as a pathology, but that's just a joke. Then hate speech and uh, fake news. These are the pathologies of sudden connectivity. That is, the connectivity has come upon us so quickly, we're still learning how to deal with it. And then there are the dimensions of connectivity. I mean, you could argue that we're halfway there. Half of the human race is now networked. I guess we're halfway done, and we just have to wait another 50 years, and everybody will be on the internet. Well, that's not the case because the number of people on the internet is only one of the many dimensions of connectivity. There is the reach, the number of people, but also the speed. How quickly are we uh, reaching them and are they reaching each other? What's the cost of this connectivity? What's the latency, mobility, anonymity? These are the many dimensions of connectivity. So there's lots of room in this n-dimensional space for progress on the advancement of connectivity. And, and one thing I'd like to, uh, one, I call it the node network paradox, but this is also evidence that there's headroom in connectivity. There's room for improvement. And you can see it in this comparison. Transistors are much better than, than neurons as network nodes. Transistors like 10 to the 10th times faster than neurons, but neurons make more intelligent networks, human brain. And the reason is that the neurons know how to be connected. And we're still learning how to connect our transceiver, the transistors. So this is evidence that there's headroom, room for improvement uh, in the uh, connectivity. Now, COVID-19 arrived last year, hence the 19. Uh, at the same year, the internet had just turned 50. It is almost as if the internet was built for COVID because suddenly the internet is carrying a lot of traffic that it wasn't carrying before. For example, this traffic right here. So we were slowly learning how to telecommute to work and suddenly it is mandatory. And we, we were learning, especially at MIT with edX and before that OCW, we were learning about internet learning as opposed to brick and mortar education. Suddenly, suddenly it is mandatory. Uh, all the classes at the University of Texas and at MIT are uh, online now. Suddenly, despite all the objections to the people who said, uh, you really can't do that, but you really can do that. And even the researchers who are working to cure COVID are connected by the internet and they're collaborating and sharing data thanks to the existence of the internet. Of the internet. So we should worry about the pathologies of the uh, internet, and I do but we need to grab the many opportunities that it presents. So here we are, overwhelmed with the connectivity of the first 50 years of the growth of the internet, but the next generation internet is already upon us. I call it the augmented video mobile gigabit internet. We went from kilobit internet to megabit internet. We're now going to gigabit internet of things. So hold on to your hat because here comes the next wave of connectivity and with that, uh, I rest my case. All right. Um, well, we've got some questions coming in. Um, and if you have one, uh, it's still time. So if you want to uh, ask a question, Professor Metcalf, just go ahead into the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, and you can also use that, that feature to, up, to upvote other people's questions uh, and let me know which ones you want me to, to ask first. Um, you took us all the way up to 2019, so I'm going to jump to this question from uh, Henry or possibly Henri Dar. He says, thanks for your talk. We're now in the internet age. Um, do you think it took us a long time to arrive here? Or are you happy with the speed things have developed? And where do you see things going in the future? Well, I'm ambivalent. Uh, while we were growing the internet, I was crazy with how slow things were going and how slow the status, you know, the status quo is quite a uh, resourceful, mean, nasty thing. And so the preceding networks, the telecom networks, Sonnet in particular from the telephone companies were 
uh, slowed down the accelerating uh, internet. On the other hand, the other hand, I, I, I'm impressed at how quickly we've reached more than half of the human race in only 50 years. So frustratingly slow, but amazingly fast has come the internet. We have a question also um, from uh, Jay Lopez, who wants to know, you know, thinking of who's still not online, what the implications of the digital divide are for minorities in the US, um, for people who still aren't able to connect. What does it mean for them? What does it mean for them? It means, well, I, I think the internet is spreading rapidly. I think I mentioned 9% additional people joined last year. So I believe the way the uh, digital divide gets solved is by continued proliferation, cost reduction uh, of the technologies that underlie the internet. Uh, I also think that the, that the uh, digital divide is somewhat exaggerated because people are resourceful and they know how good the internet is. So they find a way on it. They find ways onto the internet which are not counted in the uh, surveys of the digital divide. Anyway, uh, we should all be on uh, the internet. I, I believe most of us are already and, and more and more every day. Um, I'm sorry, that wasn't a great answer to your question, but. We have, a, it's, we have actually another question. This is the top question right now. It's also about the digital divide uh, from John Duncanson, class of 68. He says, please comment about how much effort to bridge the digital divide is focused on getting people physically connected to the internet and very little on the last two feet from the screen into the mind of the end user. User interfaces are poorly designed. Developers don't understand how to write for technology challenge people or not trained in usability. For example, my 80 something friend knows how to use email and receive photos of grandkids and little else. Well, I think that question requires some perspective. It, when I first got into the computing business, the user interface was punching cards on a punch card reader and having the ant your error messages printed out the next day on a line printer. So to me, the uh, iPhone is a amazing user interface that's better than anything I've ever seen. So uh, uh, I guess I don't subscribe to how terrible the user interface is. Uh, I think it's gotten a lot better. Now, maybe you just joined recently, so you don't see how bad it was before uh, we invented um, uh, the Macintosh and the iPhone and Windows and all those others. Uh, that's all I can think of to say to that. Um, since you mentioned the invention of uh, all these different products, I want to jump to this question from Steve Webster. He wants to know, in your, in your view, from your perspective, why did the Xerox Alto not emerge as a personal computer platform? Uh, the, well, it did. The Xerox Alto um, became the uh, Macintosh, which became Windows, which became the iPhone. So the, it is true that uh, Xerox didn't sell a bunch of Alto PCs, but it, think of it as a prototype. And uh, and it, books have been written about why Xerox didn't successfully sell a lot of them, but keep in mind they were quite expensive. It took, it took Steve Jobs to, to repackage, as it were, the uh, Alto into the Macintosh, which was a tenth the price from 16,000 to 1,600. Uh, so it took Steve's uh, focus on cost reduction and what was adequate so for example, he, uh, Steve took Ethernet, which was 10 megabits per second, and he produced Apple Talk, which was, I forget, 250 kilobits per second, because he felt that was adequate. And that greatly reduced the cost of the, the Macintosh. So the, so the Alto uh, was too soon to be sold. It was uh, too expensive. And then it was it also, it was in the hands of a company that didn't know how to compete. Uh, in, Xerox was a monopoly and didn't really know how to compete. And then, and then we tried to get into the computer business and got, uh, got our computers handed to us. Uh, read Fumbling the Future, a book about this very topic. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, Rod Walker wants to know if you have any examples of what you see us being able to do in three to five years that we can't do today. 
oh, well, we'll be able to have a Zoom conference without me talking about user interfaces, bumbling through the various features of Zoom to get to the correct answer. I guess we will have perfected by then. Uh, yeah, let me, let me focus on Zoom, for example. Uh, Zoom and, and the similar products have uh, saved our bacon. I mean, uh, COVID-19 has had a t terrible impact, but it would have been much worse had we not had the internet to continue uh, uh, social exchange and em em employment for many people. So the, uh, so then people, then the argument is resumed about whether you can really, can you really do business and socialize electronically or do you really need to press the flesh the old fashioned way? And, and uh, I think the answer is that the, we're going uh, in the next three to five years, we're going online even more so than ever. And we're, we're not going to use Zoom as it exists today. So Zoom is already itself undergoing rapid uh, evolution, but the competitors are coming in. So this whole landscape of how we do uh, network communication is going to change and it's going to improve. So I guess my, my principal answer to your three to five year question is that we're going to be using, uh, if you think this is a lot of use of video, we're going to be using a lot more video conferencing. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine why we will have any more conferences where people actually fly to an auditorium when you, when with improved tools, we'll be able to hold conferences online, I think. So we're, we'll have conferences online, we'll be meeting like this online. Um, and you mentioned schools as well. Um, so I'm gonna jump to Alan Wexelblatt's question. Um, he says that, you said that internet learning is obsoleting brick and mortar. Um, study after study shows that at-home learners fall significantly behind uh, their in-person educated peers and wants to know what, what you think about that. Well, I don't believe any polls like that because uh, when the internet first came along, there were all sorts of polls about why you didn't need 50 kilobits per second. There were all sorts of polls about this and that. Uh, uh, my hunch, uh, although I, I have little evidence to support this, is that the, uh, the people learning online will learn a lot more. Uh, just think of the economics. Right now we have a K-12 bachelor's, master's, PhD education system, which is increasing cost and, low co and decreasing effectiveness uh, dramatically. We have, uh, but now when we go to video, the, the the economics of video courses is orders of magnitude better than uh, having everybody stand up and give a lecture. And the, uh, the tools that we're going to assemble around edX and other similar online tools are growing. Those tools are improving all the time at a rate faster than uh, uh, brick and mortar education. So uh, I don't accept that poll that says that uh, uh, online learners are slower than uh, slower learners than in-person learn. I just don't accept that. And the economics, even if it were true, the economics are terrible. That is uh, training up all of the, you know, you really just need one really good, super good physics professor to teach physics and then a bunch of assistants who could be students. Uh, it's not clear to me why you need an ACE physics professor uh, or several of them in every uh, every university, uh, you know. Uh, you see the point I'm making. The economics of of uh, uh, when you go online, the production values can be higher. The uh, the talent can be um, leveraged over a much larger audience, and the education doesn't have to be limited to K twelve bachelor's, master's, PhD. It can be lifelong learning. And if you talk about the digital divide. Think about the educational divide and how the uh, online learning can bridge the educational divide and bring uh, education to many places where it would not be otherwise available. Thanks for that. Let me um, see the top question right now. We have John Lee who wants to know your thoughts on net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality was a bad idea and it, thank God it's gone. And the, uh, the reason it's a bad idea is that it involved, the way it's packaged is as a regulation of the internet by the FCC of the United States government. So I can remember when the US government uh, uh, regulated uh, what was then the, 
the, the uh, internet. It regulated AT&T as a monopoly and it regulated IBM as a monopoly. And in order to build the internet, we had to break those two monopolies. So the thought of bringing the FCC back in to regulate the internet is uh, abhorrent, it's just a horrible idea. And, and thank God it was, uh, uh, you know, the internet lived a long, happy life without net neutrality, almost 50 years. And then it was in for a couple of years and, and uh, people started thinking uh, the internet had always been subject to net neutrality, which is not true. Uh, so uh, the internet's doing fine without net neutrality. That's my, uh, my opinion. Let's, um, so you mentioned the different pathologies um, that have plagued the, our connectivity. Um, we have a question here about, um, you mentioned fake news on that slide. And someone wants to know if you see a serious threat to democracy from fake information that people see on, on social network platforms. Yes, we're in, uh, it's a very complicated time because you have uh, bad outcomes on both sides that you have to be careful of. Uh, but I think uh, we've made a mistake. I think we've asked Google and Facebook and Twitter to um, um, protect us from fake news by filtering it out. And then they made a mistake by agreeing to do it. And they're not, they're not the proper bodies to be uh, filtering fake news. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't thought of uh, an alternative. Uh, we don't. We don't want. Uh, we don't want Google and Facebook uh, and Twitter deciding what is news and what is fake. Uh, be, uh, uh, they just can't be trusted with that. And um, so I'm looking forward to some sort of evolution that brings us to some happy meeting. But I do not have the answer now. I think the questioner is right. It's it's a really serious problem and a threat to uh, uh, civilization. So not in the hands of, you know, these big internet giants, but maybe like a government effort or do you have a sense of, we have a question from Dave as well, who's thinking, asked, you know, should we be putting more, more effort into dealing with these different pathologies that um, are popping up? Yeah, I think there's room for invention here. I think, may, uh, by the way, the government is, the government filtering fake news is even worse than having the big tech giants do it. So please, don't give it a cute name like net neutrality and try to ram that through the FCC. Uh, the, uh, uh, my, my picture, a uh, first draft would be a tool that we could all use to assemble our own uh, filters, sort of an editable, composable filter system where you could, uh, if you want, uh, you'd have news with brand names like New York Times would be a, probably one of the first ones. And if you wanted to include the New York Times filter in your newsfeed, you would just click and move it in. And then if you wanted to delete everything coming from Twitter, you, you could put a minus sign in front of it and compose a filter that had nothing in Twitter and everything from the New York Times. And it would be up to you to choose and compose your filters. And it would be up to the filters to compete for your attention by being good uh, purveyors of news. Anyway, that's the first cut of what uh, you all, uh, I should be working on, but I'm busy doing other stuff. You should, uh, somebody else should invent that tool and uh, something like that might be the solution to this problem. A composable, editable, uh, personal filter system for news rather than relying on the government or the, the tech companies to do the filtering for you. There you go, free idea for, for people tuning in. Um, what about uh, Chris Craven, 84, asked about AI. You know, how do you see AI contributing to the growth of the internet? Uh, it's the other way around. So AI is, uh, by the way, my uh, undergraduate thesis advisor at MIT was Marvin Minsky in 1968. And I wrote a dissertation for Marvin on a neuron model and some of its information processing capabilities. Fortunately, all copies of that thesis have been lost. The, uh, but AI has been around at least 50 years, coming and going. Every once in a while, it rears up as the next big thing. And then it, there's a, for some reason, it goes away. And this is like the fourth or fifth time that AI has uh, risen. I, I just think of AI as a, as a, a 
smart, uh, better algorithms. Uh, but I suppose if they mimic human or uh, compete with human intelligence, we call them AI. But I don't think AI is going to help the internet. It's going to be the other way around. That is, the reason AI has crashed in the past is from a lack of data. The intelligence needs to, data to process it. And in previous instantiations of the AI bubble, they've run out of data. The, the intelligence had nothing to work on. But now we have the internet. So now these AI machines have data. So the, my theory is that this AI, this period of AI is going to be much more impactful than the previous attempts at uh, AIification. Uh, and the reason will be because we now have connectivity. And through that connectivity, we can feed our AIs and give them the data they need to make, uh, make their sensible decisions. Um. I want to keep the, the focus on future for this for a second. There's a question here from Bruce Roberts. I'm curious to know. He, you know, he asks, is internet well structured to handle internet of things devices and the explosion we've seen there? And he also wants to know if you have any internet of things devices uh, in your home. I do and there. <laughs> my house is full of the nth generation home automation system. And every time and I I've been around a while and had a lot of houses and had a lot of home automation systems put in and now they're called internet of things things and they always promise you they're going to be easy to use this goes back to the ease of use question before they're not easy to use they're a real pain in the neck but they're going to get better um, um, so is the internet set up to carry the internet things the internet of things and i think the answer is yes but remember, the internet's evolving, and the Internet of Things is evolving. So that's a continuing co-evolution co question. But remember, we used to ask, can the internet carry video? I mean, I used to mock those little postage stamp size videos that were jerky things. In the and and the question was, the internet was never designed to carry video. I can verify that the internet was not designed to carry video. And so then in the 90s, the question arose, well, can it carry video? And people said, no, it can't. Packets aren't good for that. And other people said, of course it can. We have dense wave division multiplexing now. Same question then arises for the Internet of Things. It was, the Internet was not designed for the Internet of Things, but it's evolving. It's co-evolving with uh, our technology. So I think, I think the Internet will not be the the limiting factor in the proliferation of the Internet of Things. I think it'll have more to do with, you know, finding uh, valuable uses for things and getting those things tied together uh, with the Internet, which people are working on furiously. So uh, that's why I think the next wave of, well, there are already more things on the Internet than there are people. And that, that, disparity is going to grow that is the it will eventually be the internet of things and a few people like today the internet is the internet of video and a few other things I mean, most internet traffic is video now even though the people doubted for a long time that the internet could carry it we have a few more minutes here um, and we have 68 questions so i don't think we're going to get to to the, all of them um there I, there are a few different people who have asked about privacy. Um, I'll take Lisa Eckhoff's question as an example. She says that it seems to me that privacy is dead and we spend too many resources protecting it. There needs to be a way for a user to protect the things that matter to them. She was an example of you know, transferring health information it can get very, very complicated. So curious to hear your thoughts on, on that because that's such a thorny issue for many internet users right now. So I'm not an expert on that. Uh, but I have noticed that every conference I've ever attended for the last uh, 50 or 60 years has had a section on privacy. So privacy and protecting it is a recurring issue. It is not going to go away it's, uh, if the past is any guide. There's, and the, one of the problems is that we want our privacy, but we want transparency. I want my privacy, but I want you to be transparent. And, so then you turn that around and you realize that privacy is a, is a matter of degree and controlling what's yours is an important part of that. Uh, on the, uh, but to just make a jump, there's this thing called HIPAA. 
And HIPAA is uh, supposed to protect our health information. And I'm not a doctor and I'm not an expert on medical uh, health care, but having been to a, a gazillion presentations on advances in health healthcare, HIPAA is slowing things down. Uh, HIPAA was an overreaction to privacy on medical things. And as a result, you know, we would really like to revolutionize healthcare with the internet and, and information technology in general. But HIPAA is, from where I sit, is an obstacle. It needs to be calmed down. It's, it, it overdoes things. I mean, how many times it's form over substance. I'm always signing these forms, giving my information away. It's like agreeing to the terms of use of uh, Amazon. No one ever reads those things. So it's a um, toned down HIPAA would be my advice. We got time for one more and actually I'm gonna go with Jack because I think it's a nice way to end. He just wants to know what you're working on right now. Uh, something completely different. My, my new enthusiasm uh, about six months ago, I've begun working on geothermal energy. The idea is to solve energy once and for all, and to provide ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous, cheap, clean energy by harvesting the heat of the earth. So the earth is pretty hot, uh, the uh, you know, 6,000 degrees centigrade near the core. And uh, that, so we shouldn't be creating more heat. We should just use the heat we already have. Now, to do that, we have to drill for it. We have to go down and get it. It's, you know, five to 10, 15 kilometers down, depending. And uh, so the project I'm working on is, since I'm in Austin, Texas, which is in Texas, a couple hours from Houston, which is the energy capital of the world, uh, our theory is we need to take the 200-year-old the technologies of the oil and gas industry, many of which are idle right now, thanks to the, uh, what do you call it, the oil crunch, uh, to take many of those resources and turn them to solving the problems of deep uh, deep geothermal energy, baseload electricity from the heat of the earth. That's my new project. I'm principal investigator of a project at the University of Texas on getting startups to solve the technological problems of uh, uh, harvesting the earth's heat economically and safely. I can't say that's not, not the answer I think a lot of us were expecting, so it's interesting to hear that. Thanks to Jack for thinking of that question. Um, so this takes us right to, I think, the end of our time today. Professor, I want to thank you so much um, for your time. I don't know if there's anything you want to add before I uh, say the last little bits here to lead us out. No, I'm really delighted that you invited me to express my opinion. I'm, uh, I'm sorry if I offended anyone. And uh, uh, stay healthy. Wear a mask. I'm not wearing a mask. This is one of the few times I don't wear a mask. I'm sitting in my own office with the doors closed and the dogs aren't in here. Uh, so uh, be careful, uh, wear a mask, and um, uh, thanks to this opportunity to opine. Good, uh, good advice to get out. I got mine uh, right next to me over here. Um, and for everyone who joined in today, we had more than 300 people, I think. Joe can clarify that. But um, on behalf of the Alumni Association, I want to thank everyone who tuned in to this faculty forum online. Um, We'll be sure to forward all the questions that got asked uh, that we didn't get to today um, to Professor Metcalf. Um, and I think alumni office staff are going to keep the chat window open for networking uh, for another 15 minutes. Um, this broadcast will also be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today. So thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Wear the mask. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.